The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and his, his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. As... Um, some of you know, probably from my previous children's sermons, I'm a great fan of J.K. Rowling and her Harry Potter books. And um, many of you are likewise familiar with that series, I'm sure, either having read the books or seen some of the movies. And, you know, Harry Potter spends most of his year living at Hogwarts, the school that he attends, of of um, magic, and uh, students uh, who are there and professors and head, headmasters there are there, and so are a, a goodly number of ghosts. There's Peeves, and there's nearly headless Nick, and there's moaning Myrtle, and uh, sundry of specters that are part of the life of Harry Potter at Hogwarts. There are lots and lots of ghosts at that place. Of course, Miss Rawling is not the only one who has employed uh, ghosts in their storytelling, is she? Some of the most famous writers in the English language have managed that. The ghost of Jacob Marley, for instance, in Dickens's A Christmas Carol, or the ghost of Banquo in Shakespeare's Macbeth. Right? The silver screen, of course, has its share of ghost stories. Hollywood is, is full of, well, Ghostbusters and its remake uh, not so very long ago, and The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, still a classic. Last night I was watching uh, TV, and what should come up was the 15th anniversary of Pirates of the Caribbean. And you know how in, in that movie, uh, the evil uh, Caribbean pirate Barbosa says, uh, well, he strikes fear in the heart of Miss Elizabeth Swan, the heroine, when he says, uh, um, you're in a ghost story. Stories of ghosts. They have a long an honored history in both our finest literature and our finest films. In fact, ghost stories are, are so prominent you can hardly uh, uh, miss knowing that, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking uh, we even have uh, these ghost uh, walks, right? St. Petersburg, John's uh, Pass has one. Um, 
New Orleans, just about every city of any, of any age or stature has these ghost walks that you, you can take. Ghost stories abound in our civilization. And you know, of course, uh, you can even find them in our scriptures. All right? Um, and you take our gospel story today. And the disciples there, they think that they have seen a ghost. Jesus comes and stands in their midst and their response is to think that they are seeing a ghost. In this episode that comes from St. Luke's Gospel, the disciples are still pretty much in the dark about the resurrection. And the women who had gone to the tomb with the uh, spices to anoint the body of Jesus had told the, the disciples that the tomb was empty and had told them what they had discovered. And it says in Luke 24, verse 11, these words, it says, it seemed to the disciples now, these words seemed to them an idle tale. And... They did not believe them. And so a little later on, on that first Easter day, our text says that Jesus himself stood among them, said to them, Peace be with you. And they were startled, and they were terrified as though they were seeing a ghost, says our passage. And I'm sure that you can appreciate that, uh, the kind of effect that something like that might have upon you. Imagine attending the funeral of a friend. Well, let's say Dot. If you go to Dot's funeral this, this Friday, and then three days later, Dot shows up and says, hey, y'all. Well, I'd be kind of frightened by that, to be honest. And the disciples were certainly in that category, startled, terrified, wondering that they were seeing a ghost. And so under the circumstances, it comes as no surprise that the Lord Jesus should immediately attempt to set out a calming the fears of these uh, colleagues and associates of his. And he wants them, he wants to dispel in them any notion that um, they're somehow caught up in another ghost story. And therefore, to counter their sense of terror at what they were seeing, he urges them, you know, touch me, touch me. Feel that I'm still in a human body of some kind and sees these marks that yet remain of being crucified. He wants them to touch him, to feel him, um, to know that he is yet fleshly, human. He wants them to know that he's not a specter, that he's not an apparition, that he's not a ghost. It is I, myself, he says to them. And then he asks them for something to eat, right? And they give him a piece of broiled fish. And Luke says he took it and ate in their presence and Uh, Yeah, that's what he says. And it wasn't because Jesus was especially hungry, I suspect, uh, here, but it is a a way of of presenting himself and showing his disciples that he is truly a living human being. He was Jesus, the man, now alive on the far side of the the grave. It's not a ghost of Jesus that has come to disciples. 
It is Jesus. I, myself. It strikes me that Jesus is at pains here to make sure that we do not look at the resurrection as if it were a ghost story of a kind. That he wants us to understand that even though he is now risen, he is still very, very much the human Jesus. He wants his disciples, both of that day and age and of this day and age, to know that his humanity was not artificial. That he wasn't a pretend man. That it wasn't a case of his, of his presence on earth being that of a God who then could take any shape he wanted and so morphed himself into a human look-alike for a few decades uh, like a disguised alien of some sort. No, the Lord's presence was not a disguise in his life on earth. It was not fake. It was not pretend. Jesus was and he still is truly human. You see, Jesus wants you and me to know that our Lord is indeed risen, but he especially wants us to know that he is risen as a human being. He especially wants you and me to know that he is no way given up or thrown off his humanity. The risen Jesus is the Jesus who walked the earth and spoke peace. The risen Jesus is the Jesus who sailed Lake Galilee with the twelve and ate fish and bread with them. The risen Jesus is the Jesus who was hung on the cross with nails in his hands and spikes in his feet. And the risen Jesus wants you to be absolutely clear that he is the human Jesus as well as the divine Jesus who is risen from the dead. I don't know exactly how to say it, so I'll just flat out say I, I won't pretend to know more about the resurrection of the body that we confess in our creed than I really do. The resurrected Jesus, you know, passes through walls, goes through locked doors into locked rooms. He appears and he disappears, and he's sometimes recognized by those who knew him well and sometimes they don't seem to have a clue. I think it's pretty safe to say that our resurrected Lord is not exactly, not precisely as he was prior to his being raised. And yet, by the same token, the resurrection story, just like the other resurrection stories. This resurrection story makes it very clear that Jesus, raised from the dead, is still the same Jesus in all things, being human as well as divine. And of course, you and I were joined to Jesus through our baptism, through faith. We're also joined to him as flesh and bones beings. His is the first resurrected human life. The first fruits, as Paul would frame it. The first war, one who has been transformed into the, the new Adam and the new creation. And as he is the first fruits of resurrected humankind, 
So all who belong to him, who are joined to him, at the last receive the gift of bodily resurrection that he enjoys now. Jesus, the resurrected man who eats fish, who gives hope to all of us who are ourselves like him, flesh and bone. Jesus is raised. He's not a ghost. We will be raised. We will not be ghosts. Like it is for Christ. We will not be another ghost story either. Indeed, what we, we have here in this lesson is not another ghost story. Rather, it's the story of the Son of God, who is also the Son of Mary. It is the story of the man Jesus, the human Jesus, the true flesh and bones Jesus who died on the cross, but who rose again from the dead into an everlasting life, eternally alive. He is eternally present with his followers in the power of the Spirit. Eternally alive, he's in the midst of his disciples, continually offering to them his peace. But he does all of that, not as a shade, not as a specter, not as a ghost. He does so as our brother in the flesh and as the spirit-filled son of the Father, both united in him. And certain of the resurrection in the body I believe we can be certain there is a resurrection for this body and for your body as well. Amen. Christ is risen.